Last week, I released a lesson about the practice pad. I knew it would be controversial. Close as possible. What's the conclusion? And it was. Clearly, I touched a powder keg. Here are just some of the comments I got. To be fair, in that lesson, I wasn't exactly saying, let's just dispense with the practice pad entirely. I'd tried a practice pad challenge and been found wanting. So I invented a way to improve, and I did improve. So I had a choice. Accept the minor differences in opinion and move on in the interest of getting along or push back and make a better case for my arguments. And what can I say? Maybe it's the weather this week. I wasn't feeling very conciliatory. So in this lesson, I'm gonna outline exactly which arguments triggered me the most and what I disagree with. But there's also the very real issue of my technique deficiency. If I don't address that, this whole thing will be easier to criticize. So we're also going to talk about some alternatives. Let's start with the technical problem. In fact, here's some footage of my day one practice for the challenge. And here's some footage of me playing singles on the snare of the kit. No doubt about it, my left hand is slicing. Not that beautiful up and down motion we like to see. So, what does the orthodoxy say about it? Well, according to the orthodoxy, the way to work that out is by practicing on the pad. Here's Jared. And this is why I love practicing stuff on a pad first, because I get it down, get to analyze my technique, make sure everything's looking good. Then once I feel like it's ready to go, I take it to the kit and give it a try. And here's a commenter telling me to do stick control. And to be fair, I don't think they're wrong. If we accept the assumption that your hand technique needs to be pad perfect in order to get a good sound on the kit, there are a number of reasons for starting on the pad. Yes, you can probably hear things more cleanly. You get more information about the evenness of your strokes. You can isolate. Even if you were just playing on the snare drum sitting at the kit, you'd probably be tempted to noodle. The sparseness of the pad forces you to focus. These are in addition to all the other reasons I mentioned last week, like you might not have access to a kit, or you might be living in an apartment where you need to keep quiet. So we accept that playing stick control, or my personal favorite, Charlie Wilcoxon, on the pad is one way to make your hand technique more textbook on the kit. But now for the question that's going to make some of you mad at me. Is it the best way? Okay, time for a big right turn. Meet Mr. Keenan Cornelius and Mr. John Donner. Keenan and John are two jujitsu coaches with a modernistic approach to coaching. Keenan's still an active competitor while Donner, due to an injury, just coaches. BJJ instruction seems to be undergoing a little bit of a revolution. Here was my theory. Some jujitsu is taught as follows. Students come into class when it suits them. They get the teacher who happens to be teaching the class at that time. They learn a concept the teacher happens to be teaching that day. Then they do at least a half hour of live sparring, during which they may or may not find themselves in situations directly relevant to the day's lesson. They repeat this and, it's hoped, eventually connect the dots over the years. But Keenan, Donahue, and some others are doing it differently. Starting with a real-world scenario, 
So you're gonna do one, one guard resistance, and then turn away, and then the drill continues. Take it back. All right? Letting it play out. You're gonna work to pass the guard, and he's gonna resist one time, and you have to transition into a second pass. Leg drag. Boom. Seat belt. Get the chair sit position. Take the back. Good. Then pausing, making corrections, and restarting. Same thing. But as he goes to take your back, you can try make do a movement to defend the back. Back to the drums before I lose you. If we take the analogy, there's a real world discipline that you're practicing every day. In BJJ, it's live sparring. And in drums, it's improvising on the drums. And there's an orthodox approach, which involves taking an isolated concept, drilling it, and hoping it pops up in a real world situation. For drums, this is practicing written exercises out of a book, whether it's stick control or Ted Reed syncopation or what have you. Then there's another approach, one in which you simulate real world combat in a controlled environment and derive what exercises to work on from what actually happens in those live situations. For instance, if we do a live drill and I get my back taken in the first 30 seconds of that drill, then the teacher resets us and tells me how to avoid getting my back taken, then restarts the clock and I make another attempt. But what would this look like on the drums? Here I am improvising. If you watch my left hand, I'm clearly slicing a bit. What if instead of taking the orthodox approach, like starting my next session with 25 minutes of stick control and hoping it redounds to my kit playing, I just stopped the clock, isolated the exact thing I was working on on the kit, and was mindful about not slicing. I could break the lick down to as essential an element as I needed to. and drill that for a few minutes. Then gradually add speed and other stuff back in. When that was done, I could move on and improvise more until I got to the next bit, then repeat the process. I could check for slicing by comparing a snare cam video from before to one from after, as I did for the practice pad challenge last week. Here's the thing about martial arts. Many of the teaching methods, old and new, do work. But many of the folks I speak to agree there's kind of a fast lane and a slow lane. One way to get better quickly is to be super athletic and just train three times a day. But another is to use a superior method. Gordon Ryan, arguably the world's best grappler, had both advantages. Sure, he's a human specimen. But he also learned a specific system from John Donahue that allowed him and his teammates to defeat much more experienced opponents. What if relying solely on the practice pad isn't a bad way to improve one's hands? But it's just not the fastest way. Here's the other thing about martial arts. For better or worse, they're a good laboratory to test what's working because you're facing resisting opponents. Either the instruction works and you prevail, or it doesn't and your opponent does. In drums, by contrast, there isn't really a lot of data on what causes quick success. Nobody's saying Eric Harlan got his black belt in four years, whereas most people take 10. You don't have those measurements, which might be good. After all, art isn't zero sum the way competition is, and that's good. But if we're being frank, 
it can also slow innovation. But there's another problem with the whole premise of this lesson. Why do we care so much if hand technique is pretty if it doesn't contribute to the final result? For years, martial arts had this problem. Which is better, Aikido, Shotokan, maybe Muay Thai? Nobody knew because nobody put the forms against one another in the modern era. Then came UFC 1. All of a sudden, we could see what worked in real combat. At least in the ring against a single opponent with no weapons permitted. More importantly, techniques could now be measured along some objective standard. Whether they worked in the ring against a resisting opponent. The upshot? There were a lot of techniques that looked pretty. Many of which simply didn't work in the ring if an opponent knew what he was doing. In drums, it doesn't seem like anybody's really run that experiment. But what if we took the same standard and applied it to drums? What if we threw out any orthodoxies that weren't the best method for helping real kit playing? Seem radical? Well, there are already techniques which we've gotten rid of over the years, which look showy and cool, but don't improve the overall sound very much. Watch Sonny Payne, one of my favorite big band drummers and a master showman. You'll see some of his tricks in drum lines. But you won't see them very much in kit playing anymore. Probably because they weren't make or break for sounding great on the kit. And I'll throw in another conjecture, as the venue in which we listen to music moved from primarily live to primarily through our headphones, the showy stuff that translated to a live crowd probably fell by the wayside too. Like, here I am improvising. Is my left hand slicing? A bit. But does it affect the sound on the drums and my ability to improvise? Here's the plot twist. It does. A little. A few years back when I switched back from trad grip to matched on the kit, I noticed my left hand was starting to get tired a little faster than my right. Now that I know I'm over controlling the stick, it makes sense. So even by our martial arts standards, a clean hand technique that allows unfettered vertical travel of the sticks does seem important to real kit playing, insofar as if you don't have it, you'll eventually hit roadblocks. But that doesn't change the fact that I'm trying to convey in this lesson. Maybe the answer was, yes, we need it. But no one was asking the question. And very few voices are asking, is the conventional way of doing this the fastest way? Oh, small sales pitch. While it's clear I need back to the drawing board time with all of this, I've got an entire course of helpful real life derived hand and coordination exercises on the kit. That course is called the coaching course. And I only open it up a few times a year. But if you'd like to be notified of when I open it next, and if you'd like a completely free gateway drug to the type of stuff I teach in the course, go ahead and click the link below this player Enter your email on the next page, and I'll send you three free videos in three weeks, which I assert will make you better in the next three weeks than you've gotten in the last six months. Dudes, always have fun breaking this stuff down. We'll see you very soon in another lesson of the week.